Today I want to speak to you on the subject of three things you need to know about the end times. And obviously when you preach or teach on Bible prophecy, uh, you never have the ability in one setting uh, to be exhaustive about any subject in Bible prophecy. And so my pattern oftentimes is to realize that people are hungry to learn about Bible prophecy, but you can't overwhelm them with too much. And so I'm trying to do better as I get older in breaking these things down into bite-sized pieces, and that's what I'm going to endeavor to do today. I want to show you three things about Bible prophecy and the end times that, in my opinion, you must understand in navigating these last days. I'm reading out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I love the Bible. I'm going to read the entire 17 verses out of this third chapter because nothing that I'll say in the moments ahead will be better than the Bible. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Pause right there. I am very concerned with the amount of false teaching and false prophets that have found their way onto the internet and vulnerable Christians are listening to them as if everything they say is from the mouth of God. Everything must be brought into agreement with what the Bible says. I listened to one individual the other day just briefly until I got so agitated I couldn't listen anymore. And everything they were saying was from a dream they had. Now, I do believe that God uses dreams. The Bible speaks of that in the Old Testament book of Joel in the second chapter. But everything they said went back to their dream, and the dream was based upon an encounter they had with Dave Chappelle, which was red flag number one that what was about to come out of their mouth may be the same thing they shovel at the local barns <laughs> on a regular basis. And I was flabbergasted at the details of the ridiculousness number one of the dream and then tying it and saying that this is the word of the Lord when almost everything that was stated violated what's in the Bible. The word of the Lord stands above all and everything must be tested by the integrity of thus saith the Lord and this old-fashioned Bible is thus saith the Lord. If you believe it and receive it, give the Lord praise. Amen. Difficult times will come. And yet we have individuals that are prophesying that it's going to be a return to uh, prosperity and it's going to be a return to America as it was in the 40s and 50s and God's going to turn it all back to leave it to beaver and, and all of the wonderful case scenarios that are being spoken that violate the Bible. I know this is not popular, but it's the Bible. And the Bible said things are going to get worse and worse. But that does not undo the promises of God to the church and to the believer. We have a covenant with God that will carry us through on a different level because we are united to the Word, united to prayer, united to a Bible-believing local church. We will walk through this in victory and not defeat. But trying to convince people that what's happening in our world and what's happening in our nation and what's happening in global governments is just temporary, is a violation of what the Scripture said would take place in the end times. Verse 2, For people will love only themselves 
and their money. We actually have a word that fulfills this prophecy of Paul. It's called selfies. Paul had no idea when he told Timothy that one of the signs of the end times is the world will love themselves. And we live in a day and an age in which people have this urgency to document almost every waking moment of their life and their cat and their dog and their cappuccino with relentless selfies as if I care. <laughs> people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God. Recently, one of our senators who was chairing a meeting in Washington, D.C., another senator made reference to the Bible and to the moral condition of our nation. And he slammed the gavel down and said, here in Washington, D.C., we don't care what any God has to say. Proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they are never able to understand the truth. Pause there long enough to make note of the fact that many times new teachings are the opposite of God's truth. These teachers oppose the truth just as Janies and Jambres opposed Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith, but they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Janies and Jambres. Paul's charge to Timothy. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live, and what my purpose in life is. Your family, your children, your grandchildren, your circle of influence should know what your purpose in life is, should know what your faith is, should know what you believe. Verse 11, you know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from all of it. Pause once again. I want to encourage you concerning the end times, regardless of what the world goes through, because as Scripture clearly forecasts, the closer we get to the rapture, the more corrupt this world is going to become. The closer we get to the rapture of the church, the more wicked this world will become. The closer we get to the rapture of the church, the more the world is going to hate Christians and hate Christ and hate the Bible and hate the truth of righteousness and holiness. But Paul said, God rescues us from it all as we stay in right relationship with him. If you will stay in right relationship with God in these end times, there is nothing to fear because your coming King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords still has authority over everything on the face of this earth. And he still knows how to take his children and shelter them under the wings of his holy and divine protection. Can you say amen? <laughs> Verse 12, yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil people and imposters will flourish. In your footnotes, just put in parenthesis, Washington, D.C. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught, for you know they are true. For you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. If you intend on doing good works for the kingdom of God until the sound of the trumpet, raise a hand to heaven and say, thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we open up the Bible today and we speak upon three things that we must know about the end times, I pray that you will lead us and guide us by the anointing of the Spirit. I pray that every listener would have open ears and tender hearts to hear from the word of the Lord today. And I pray above all that not one person listening to me will be left behind. I pray that not one person listening to me will be running from God in the last days. But I pray that today people will run to God. Thank you for the promise of the Bible that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in this new day and age in which we live, there will be multiplied thousands who will be watching this online from all over the world. I pray that you would give them the patience to listen today and to pray with me at the end of our time together what many people call the sinner's prayer. For there are many people who are listening who don't really understand what is going on in our world, but more importantly, they don't even know what it means to be ready to meet the Lord. Help me to kindly and graciously explain to them what it really means to turn from sin and turn to Christ. Thank you for your mercy and for your grace. Speak to someone listening who needs to hear that there's no sin in their life and there's no sin in their past greater than the grace of God. And may today be the day that they call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And I pray that they would understand that their turning to God may result in their family turning to God, their children turning to God, their grandchildren turning to God, we ask that you would help us to make the gospel clear. And for all things, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the mighty name of our soon coming King, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. I am perfectly aware of the fact, because I can't read all of the comments uh, that come in, uh, one video on one platform recently had over a million views in less than a month and I think produced over 20,000 comments from around the world. But I do read from time to time the comments and it's obvious that many people are fearful. Bible prophecy makes many pe people feel awkward because of the uncertainty. 
But my entire ministry, I've done my best in communicating Bible prophecy to remind people, and don't miss this. If you're taking notes, write it down. Bible prophecy is not given to scare us, but Bible prophecy is given to prepare us. There is only a fear factor with Bible prophecy to those who do not know where they stand with God. But if you do not know where you stand with God, today is a wonderful day because I'm here just for you. And I want you to receive Christ. But if you're going to be a student of the Bible, you cannot neglect Bible prophecy. It is impossible to be a serious student of the Bible and not be a student of Bible prophecy simply because of its significant content in Bible college, in seminaries, and in teaching students. And we have Bible college students listening here this morning. There is something often taught called the law of proportion. And the law of proportion in theology is simply a term that refers to when the Scripture places a significant weight upon a subject or a topic, we should pay attention because God didn't waste words. If the Bible is heavy on a particular topic or subject, it's because God is trying through the law of proportion to drive home the significance of that subject. For example, 28.5% of the Old Testament is Bible prophecy. In the New Testament, 21.5% of the New Testament is Bible prophecy. And that makes for the total content of the Holy Bible 27% Bible prophecy. More than a quarter of your entire Bible focuses upon the foretelling of coming world events. And because we are currently watching this one world stage of end time prophecy being set before our very eyes, having a fundamental knowledge, at least, of Bible prophecy is absolutely necessary for you to navigate the season in which we live. No mistake about it. These are chaotic, and some would say dystopian times. Just as Paul prophesied, Timothy, in the last days, things will be difficult. But things are made much more difficult if you're lost and you don't have a map and you don't have a compass. But for the believer who has a fundamental knowledge of the end times and Bible prophecy, this precious and sacred book provides for you a map and a compass to help you navigate your life and your decisions with no fear whatsoever. For the believer, prophecy is our blessed hope. And it's my sincere prayer that all who are listening to this message will choose to live ready for the soon coming of the Lord. And if you're not ready, or if you're not sure you're ready, or no one has ever taken the time to explain to you how you can be ready, then I would like to personally pray with you in the moments ahead. And as I do every time I speak, regardless of the subject, I'm going to give an invitation and I'm going to challenge you to pledge your life to Christ today. Because everyone listening to me, whether you understand it or believe it or not, the Bible is clear on this fact prophetically. You will either openly and publicly pledge your life to Jesus Christ or you will openly and publicly one day pledge your life to a one world leader with a one world economy whom the Bible calls the Antichrist. I believe it was a rock singer by the name of Dylan who wrote a song, You've Got to Serve Somebody. And you may not be aware of it, but every person listening to me right now, you're serving somebody. 
And I would encourage you in these final moments of human history to make the decision for yourself and quit allowing people to make that decision for you. Choose today to pledge your life to Jesus Christ so you will not in the future have to pledge your life to the Antichrist. There is nothing more important in all of the world than knowing that you've made peace with God and have full assurance that you're ready for whatever tomorrow holds. Here are the three things that you need to know about the end times, and then we'll pray. And if you're taking notes, number one, there is a difference between the end times and the last days. And most infant Bible students and even some seasoned Bible students are not aware of that. There is a difference in Bible prophecy between the end times and the last days. I frequently hear Christians using these terms interchangeably, assuming they refer to the same thing, but they do not. They are what some might call somewhat interchangeable, and I'll explain, but they also biblically have specific application. To properly understand these Bible terms, the last days and the end times, you need to know that Bible prophecy deals with two specific covenants. First of all, in Bible prophecy, God has a covenant with Israel and his chosen people that is distinctly different than his covenant with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all of you that are new students to Bible prophecy, this is solid gold for you to understand. In Bible prophecy, everything has to be interpreted by understanding which covenant God is addressing in prophecy. And there are only two, so it's not difficult. And to understand Scripture, you always have to look at Scripture not just as a text, but in context and context within the full narrative. For example, the Old Testament almost exclusively was written to the Jewish people. And the New Testament was almost exclusively written to believers. Obviously, Israel and the Jews were included in passages as well. Let me give you a classic example of the error of not understanding this that is quite frequently said in many churches. All of my life I heard this growing up in church. In the early part of my ministry, I'm sure I made the same mistake because I was simply repeating what my patriarchs and my mentors had preached. But oftentimes growing up, I heard that classic passage out of Joel chapter 2. It'll come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and so on. The classic prophecy of Joel in the second chapter of Joel. And that passage was then interpreted that we had the promise of revival prior to the rapture. But because they didn't understand the difference between the covenant God had with the Jews and the covenant God had with prophecy in the New Testament church, it was misinterpreted because Joel chapter 2 specifically speaks about the Jews during the tribulation and not the church. Now, I do believe that the outpouring of the Spirit in the book of Acts is the conception of the fulfillment of that prophecy because the majority of those that were in the upper room were Jews. But if you don't understand who the author is speaking to, it will always cause confusion in your interpretation of end times and last days. If you're learning something today and you're still with me, let me hear a good amen. amen. God's covenant with Israel is primarily addressed in the Old Testament and God's covenant with the church is primarily addressed in the New Testament. Now notice that I specifically said primarily and not exclusively because God's dealings with Israel and the Jews are certainly mentioned in the New Testament 
as well. So the Bible uses certain terms in various ways when we speak of the last days and when we speak of the end times. In other words, are we referring to the last days of the church age or in context are we referring to the last days of God's dealings with Israel? Are we dealing with the last days for Israel and the prophetic events that are still in the future? Let me give you one summation statement that I hope will simplify this because I know for some this might be difficult to digest on a Sunday morning. So let me give it to you in one simple gold nugget. We are currently living in the last days of the church age, but the last days for Israel are still in the future. Let me say that again because it sums up almost everything I'm trying to give you in this one piece of information. And if you're a brand new Christian, what do I mean by the church age? There was no church in the Old Testament. The church is a New Testament birth. It was referenced, it was foreshadowed, there were types. But the church was never born until the first advent of Christ. And the church age ends when? With the rapture of the church. If you're taking notes, that's important. The church age began with the first advent of Christ and the church age will soon end with the next prophecy on God's calendar, the rapture of the church. Now, I don't have time to teach on the vision of Daniel and I don't have time to teach on his vision of the 70 weeks. I have an entire devoted series of teachings on our YouTube and podcast channel. I would encourage you at some point to listen to those because understanding Daniel's 70 weeks is a key component foundationally of understanding the last days and the end times. But the essence of Daniel's vision in the ninth chapter was those 70 weeks represented 70 sets of seven years. 69 of Daniel's prophetic seven-year sets have already been fulfilled. They were fulfilled with the first advent of Christ. The 70th week of seven in the book of Daniel is the tribulation, that final 70th set of seven years refers to the coming tribulation that will soon be upon this earth. The world is currently rocking with the birth pains already activated. A lot of what you're seeing in our world today, politically, geopolitically, wars, allies rooting against one another and threatening an economy and on and on and on, on levels of corruption like we've never seen before are all birth pains for that coming 70th set of seven. The Bible calls it the tribulation, and we read about it in Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19. But in between the 69th week and the 70th week in eschatology is what is called a prophetic pause. What do you mean prophetic pause? The prophetic pause is the church age. And Romans chapter 12 tells us the reason why God established the church. Jesus even prophesied about it to his disciples in Matthew 16. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Again, there's hope in prophecy. The church is on a sure foundation under the rapture of the church. They can't close it. They can't shut it down. They can't silence it. They can't mandate anything that will hinder the work of God's promise to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will succeed and advance and be victorious under the sound of the trumpet and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. That is as sure as anything you'll read in Bible prophecy. But that prophetic pause between Daniel's 69th and 70th week, Romans chapter 12 said that God brought the Gentiles in. 
who openly received Christ as Messiah, even though, by and large, the Jewish nation and the chosen people had rejected. The Bible said God did it to make them jealous. So you and I are living in a very unique window in Bible prophecy. You are in the church age. I repeat, the church age began with the first advent of Christ. And the church age is about to end with the rapture of the church. And once the rapture of the church takes place, everything in Bible prophecy swings back in full attention to God's covenant with Israel. The author of the book of Hebrews referred to the church age as the final days. If you have your Bible, look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The Bible said long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. This is the author of Hebrews referring to that prophetic covenant in the Old Testament to the Jews. But look at verse 2. But now in these final days, which is the church age, he has spoken to us through his Son. So since the entire church age is referred to in the New Testament as the last days, you and I can correctly say the church age is living in its last days. The end times and the last days referring to Israel, don't miss this, begin after the rapture. Let me say it again. The last days and the end times for Israel does not even begin until the church age ends. And that end times, last days for Israel will include the tribulation, the second coming of Christ, and the millennium. If all of those words are new to you and you just got saved five minutes ago and don't even have a Bible yet, I have a vast amount of teaching available on all of those subjects in detail on our YouTube and podcast channel, wherever in the world our online audience is watching from, avail yourself to that. And if you have further questions, send them into the office, and that's exactly how we prepare content. I'm very mindful of the questions that are sent into our office by unsafe people, unchurched people, and newly saved people that dominates my thinking in preparing content. I want people in the last days to have a trusted source that they can listen to on Bible prophecy that will guide you from where you're at to where God wants you to be. The second thing you need to know about the end times is that the regathering of the Jewish people is the most prophesied event of the end time passages in the Bible. I see many are taking notes. Let me repeat it again. The regathering of the Jewish people is the most prophesied event of the end time passages in the Bible. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 30, Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel chapter 37, Zechariah chapter 10, and multiple passages. The regathering of the Jewish people is the most prophesied event of all end time passages in the Bible. Let me just read one very distinct passage found in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 3. For the time is coming when I will restore the fortunes of my people of Israel and Judah. I will bring them home to this land that I gave to their ancestors, and they will possess it again. I, the Lord, have spoken. I have a message that I preached in many of our Lost Lamb Crusades over the last several months entitled, The Super Sign of all Bible prophecy. And the super sign of all Bible prophecy, and this is not my title, this is a title that has been used for decades by theologians, eschatology scholars, and so on. 
the regathering of the Jewish people back to their promised homeland is referred to as the super sign of all Bible prophecy. And you need to understand that two things, two momentous things must happen before these end time prophecies will be fulfilled. Jesus even spoke of it in Matthew chapter 24. And the two things concerning the end time of Israel and the future dealings of Israel and the regathering of the people, number one, first, the Bible prophesied Israel and the land God gave them will become a nation once again. The prophet Ezekiel said that the nation of Israel would be fulfilled in less than a day. And the prophet said, is it even possible, some translations read, is it even possible for an entire nation to be born in less than a day? But that's exactly what happened on May 14, 1948. It actually legally took place in a handful of minutes. And the prophecy of the scripture, can a nation be reborn in a day, was literally fulfilled on May 14, 1948. But Jesus not only mentioned Israel being restored, but Jerusalem being restored. And Jerusalem was taken back and occupied in the war of 1967. And then interestingly, as a matter of fact, to me, incredibly interesting is that our former president, along with several world luminaries, got together and recognized internationally Jerusalem as capital of Israel. And do you remember the date? May 14th, 2018, 70 years, 70 years to the day that Israel became a nation, Jerusalem internationally has been restored to them as capital. And so two end time significant prophecies for Israel. Israel must become a nation. And secondly, the Jewish people must supernaturally be seen to return to their land. The Jews were driven out of the land the first dispersion of the Jews by Titus and the Roman Empire occurred in A.D. 70 and the second took place in A.D. 135 and they were dispersed throughout the world never again to have their homeland so it seemed. As a matter of fact, after A.D. 135, there is a history of many occupants of that land that God had promised to the Jews. But I remind you that when God prophesies and when God speaks and when God makes a covenant, it shall surely come to pass. Amen. Nothing can ever invalidate the promises of Almighty God. And do you know of all of the various people who occupied the land and called it their own? Not one single occupant of that land ever declared Jerusalem as the capital. Why? They couldn't. Because God said almost 3,000 years ago, Jerusalem will be my capital forever. And do you know where Jesus will return in the second coming of Christ? The Bible tells us that his feet will touch the Mount of Olives there in Jerusalem and it will split one side to the other. And what will he do when he returns? The Bible said he'll establish his eternal throne in Jerusalem, Israel. And the prophets of God said in the Old Testament, Jerusalem in the last days will not only be the recognized capital of the promised land of Israel, but it will be the capital of the entire world. There's a reason why, even if you're a skeptic, 
of Bible prophecy, you cannot deny that in recent decades, the entire focus of the world seems to revolve around the Middle East, Israel, Muslim factions, and Jerusalem. Ezekiel prophesied in his vision of the bones that they would be restored in stages. And that's exactly what has happened through history. I have an entire teaching on that. I will not take time to teach on the valley of dry bones and Ezekiel's vision. But the essence of that is exactly what has taken place. Israel supernaturally in the late 1800s, after being dispersed the last time, AD 135, in the late 1800s, supernaturally. I mean, they were risking their life at that point to return. But they felt in their spirit to return. And a handful of brave Jews began the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy. And then it began to escalate. And did you know that by 2009, and the reason I mentioned 2009, because in 2009, there were 5.4 million Jews in Israel and 5.2 million Jews in America, most of them within a 100-mile radius of New York City. There's a reason why the Twin Towers were targeted in New York City. I don't have time to get into that, and it's not conspiracy theory, it's prophecy. But you see, when you understand prophecy, both Old Testament and New Testament, when you understand last days and end times, in how they apply to those two covenants, then the events of the world fall together like pieces in a children's puzzle. The greatest wealth of the Jewish people worldwide was in the Twin Towers in New York City. But by 2009, don't miss this, for the first time since Ezekiel's prophecy in the Old Testament of the regathering, the supernatural regathering of the Jews to their homeland. Israel becomes a nation, May 14th, 1948. Significant end time fulfillment for Israel. Jerusalem becomes their possession in 1967. Officially recognized as capital, 2018. How can you not see that these things are not coincidental. God is wrapping up the last days and the end times for his covenant both to Israel and his covenant to the church. This 2009 date is significant because it's the first time since A.D. 135 that there are now more Jews in Israel than all of the Jews in the world combined scattered elsewhere. And just to give you another interesting tidbit, Ukraine, which is in our headlines on a daily basis, was homeland to a great population of Jews in that part of the world. And when Vladimir Putin began his assault upon Ukraine after taking on Crimea and his lustful quest to reestablish as his legacy, the old Russian Empire, which is also in Bible prophecy. If you'll remember, the airports of Ukraine were a mass of people trying to get out of the country. But what the news didn't tell you is that almost all of the people in those airports were Jews trying to get back to Israel. And they are still fleeing from the Ukraine and making their way to the homeland of Israel, most of them not even realizing that they are fulfilling prophecy for the return of the Messiah. You know, Israel's res respectful of these Old Testament prophecies. They are ready for the return of the Messiah. Uh, at another time, I'd like to preach on that and, and help you to understand how close we are. The Sanhedrin is completely reestablished and functional. All of the garments prophesied in the Old Testament for the reestablishment of the third temple. There will be a third temple are already active. The temple institute in Jerusalem is active. All of the golden pieces that are being put together for the third temple have been built and are ready. 
The table of showbread is ready. The menorah is ready. By the way, that menorah made out of pure gold, exactly as it was in its original form. Do you know who built that? A Jew from the Ukraine paid for it millions of dollars out of his own pocket and returned to Jerusalem. And I could go on and on and on. The third temple is ready. Just this week I was listening to a rabbi that I follow who actually has a Twitter page but also has respected content that can be found often published in Jerusalem Post. He said, we are so sure that the Messiah is coming at any moment that we have the tabernacle of Moses and we have practiced and practiced and we will be able to set it up in less than four hours and begin the sacrifices prophesied by our Old Testament patriarchs. And so many people talk about the third temple and say, well, the rapture can't take place because the third temple is not yet built. You're painting yourself into a corner that is not supported by the exact fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The rapture could take place. They could put the tabernacle of Moses up in four hours. The third temple, main temple, is already completely cut out ready to be assembled and they could begin the assembly of the actual third temple at the exact same time people are worried about the dome of the rock it is one of the muslim sacred sites and people say they'll never be able to build a temple there and they forgot that jesus said in matthew that there will be a great earthquake that will level every wall in Jerusalem and that means that the dome of the rock is coming down by the hand of God when it's time for the third temple to be built God will build it and no group of people in the world can amass an army to stop what God has prophesied in the end times we are living closer than we have ever lived before to the soon return of the Lord. Are you living ready? Lastly, and I close with this, one of the most significant things about the end times that I believe you also must know is there will be a great falling away from faith. And I won't need a lot of time to document this because anyone who's not living off grid knows it's true by evident fact. Bible prophecy warned us that prior to the rapture there will be a great falling away from faith and if possible the very elect would be deceived. Listen to what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said, Timothy, you should know this. In the last days, there will be very difficult times. I read this as our text, but I want to bring your eyes back to the Bible. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving, and they will slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray friends and be reckless and be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Let me give you a biblical word of prophetic advice. Make your sphere of friends smaller and be careful who you allow in that circle. Because if you think who you hang out with does not affect your end time potential, you don't know your Bible. The Bible clearly tells us stay away from people like that. Well, they need Jesus. Pray for them. Witness to them when opportunity is afforded. But don't let them in so close to your intimate circle 
that their language, their gossip, their carnality, their worldly habits affect and impart upon you things that could weaken your relationship with God. And you know, I read that to you twice because it seems like the Apostle Paul could have written these words yesterday, addressing the current state of many modern denominations and many modern Christian leaders. You know, from the Greek, apostasy signified revolt from a military commander. And that's what this is. Apostasy is a revolt against the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Almighty God and His Word. Apostasy is often defined as a falling away, a withdrawal, or a defection. The growing apostasy in mainline denominations that we have witnessed in the past few years and the escalation of the perversion in mainline churches is almost unbelievable. A growing number of denominations and not a handful, a growing number are now allowing for the ordination of lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgenders, LGBTQ clergy, and on and on. They're bringing transvestites into their Sunday school classes to impact the children with that same perversion. Many evangelical leaders are now openly telling their members and being guest speakers at large world conferences, don't bring your Bible to church. A visible Bible is an offense to the people we're trying to reach. One pastor recently said, and I'll not mention his name, many of you would know him, but said, the Lord spoke to me never to take a visible Bible into my pulpit again, that it's unnecessary, that I can use a digital device and not be offensive to those who may be visiting who would be offended or triggered by the sight of a Bible. Billy Graham once filled our nation's stadiums with bold preaching on subjects like hell and holiness and the second coming of Christ. Can you imagine if Billy Graham were alive today and preached like he preached and filled a football stadium, the triggered left and the amount of backlash and the calling for his imprisonment and worse that would take place. Sadly, many of today's celebrity preachers have filled their churches with entertainment and a brief motivational message and you may never hear a word from the Bible in the entirety of many services. You can attend many churches today and little to no Bible is ever read. The gospel is never preached. Never a message on sin. Never a message on hell. Never a message on eternity. Never prayer for the sick. Never time for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Never time to seek God. Never time to pray. Never an altar call. And never an invitation to turn from sin and turn to Christ. Thank God that we have a church here that does not qualify. Paul warned in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. The pastor was sharing with me this week, and I don't remember the exact number, but I believe it was somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of all ministry, all preaching, all teaching on the internet qualifies as biblical heresy. And some of you are making a mistake by randomly clicking on ministers you don't know and preachers you don't know, having no idea what they espouse having no idea what their doctrine is, having no idea what level of theological education, if any, they have disciplined themselves to take. And if you're one of those Christians who randomly goes through the internet 
and passes and shares videos of preachers and ministers and evangelists and so-called prophets that you don't know you are actually fulfilling the words of the Apostle Paul and you are leading people into a potential apostasy by sharing heresy and it needs to stop. If you're going to survive these last days, you need to ask God in prayer for a holy handful, I repeat, a holy handful of ministers that you can trust Ministers that have credential, ministers that have tenure, ministers that have lived above reproach, ministers who hold the Bible higher than anything in their personal lives and are fearless and have backbones like a two by six who are not afraid to say from pulpits anywhere, thus saith the Lord. I pray the Holy Spirit's conviction comes upon you this week as you flip through the slop bucket salvation being preached by the vast majority of social media personalities. Thank you for all those amens. That's why we take the offering first. <laughs> I don't want to close with diagnosis. I want to close with remedy. I've given you three what I believe to be non-negotiable signs that you need to be aware of to discern the end times, the last days. I hope you'll walk away with a biblical education perhaps that some of you didn't have before understanding that Bible prophecy is focused on two covenants, one with Israel, one with the church. And you must always read the Bible and exegete Scripture with an understanding of the context to whom the author was speaking. Was he speaking to the Jews? Was he speaking to Israel? Or was he speaking to believers in the New Testament? But here's how you survive the last days. God wouldn't allow us to go through the last days and to be defeated. This same Paul who gave these warnings later told Timothy, thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not walking in fear. We're not walking in intimidation. I fear nothing but God in these last days. I have a high and holy responsibility to communicate his eternal truth and him and him alone I fear. For as a minister, the Bible said, one day I will stand in double judgment. Double judgment for what I did with his words. So don't miss this. All you need to survive and live victoriously in the last days is a life that is solidly built, unwaveringly built upon the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding of biblical foundation. A life in the word and a life in prayer will get you through everything. Let me hear a good solid amen. amen. A life in the word and a life in prayer will get you through anything. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 and 13, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. You see, if in these end times of the church age, you keep yourself sh surely planted upon the foundation of the Bible, Every deception of this world, every apostate spirit, every false prophet will be revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. If you walk in the Word, if you walk in prayer, if you cherish the presence of God, every time the mouth of an apostate individual opens to speak, you will already have a flashing red light in your spirit and pay careful attention to it. For the Bible says the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. 
Using the Word of God as your standard in every thought, every choice, every plan, every desire will protect you from being deceived and keep you free. And you will not be misled. You will not be apostate. You will not be a part of the great falling away. Because if your life and your faith and your hope is built upon the purity and the integrity of the Holy Bible, you will not only survive, you'll thrive. You'll flourish. You'll do everything God called you to do. You'll achieve everything God called you to achieve. You will do exploits for the power of God that lives in us is greater than the power, the prince in the power of the air who is currently working on world stages. I leave you with this and don't ever forget it. You'd better give up any hope you have on political salvation. Anytime I hear Christians debating politics, I know that they don't know their Bible. Because if you knew Bible prophecy, you'd know that they're all corrupt. Thank you for all of those amens. Revelation chapter 13 is very clear that all of the nations of the world and all of the political leaders of the world are moving very quickly towards the promotion of a one world leader. Just a few days ago, the World Economic Forum met for their, I believe it was five days of annual meeting. And the theme of their meeting was the call for cooperation of nations and the urgency of a one world leader to bring us into that cooperation just days ago. And I could go on down the list with multiple headlines, but I don't live my life by the headlines. I live my life by the word of the living God. Don't ever forget, listen, don't ever forget that in the end times, all world governments, including our own, will soon bow and make an open way for the arrival of whom Revelation 13 declares, the Antichrist. And Revelation 13 prophesies there's coming a one world leader, a one world government, a one-world monetary system, a one-world religion, and a one-world military power to enforce the severe mandates. Vote with conscience. Pray for politicians. But just know that they're all, whether knowingly or unknowingly, and I believe for many it's knowingly. Recent years to me have shown that there are world leaders who have sold their soul to the global one world order that's coming and have devoted their life for only God knows what price tag to push their nation in that direction Revelation 13 tells us is coming. There is no hope in Washington. There is no hope in men. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. And you will thrive in the end times if you keep your life built upon God's holy word. If you believe and receive the word of the Lord, give him a mighty hand of praise today. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Musicians, would you come? In Luke chapter 21, verses 33 through 36, the Bible said heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap, for that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man.
one serious and final question. Are you living ready for the soon return of the Lord? And if not, make that decision today. Not just for yourself. Make it for your spouse. Make it for your family. Make it for your children. Make it for your grandchildren. Make a decision today that all who follow in your path will eventually be on a path that leads to streets of gold. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to ask you to stand with me across the sanctuary one and all. I promised you at the beginning of this message that I'd like to pray with those of you who don't have that peace. In our Lost Lamb Crusades, I oftentimes ask this question, and I say oftentimes almost every night of my life. Listen to this question very carefully. Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've bowed on humble knees in the presence of a holy God and recognized your sin, repented of your sin, and received Jesus Christ. Because if no one has ever taken the time to explain to you, and that might be your question at the end of today's message, Tiff, how do I make peace with God? How do I know I'm ready? How do I begin right relationship with God? The Bible says you have to do three things. Number one, you have to recognize your sin, and that's not difficult. The Bible says all have sinned. From this preacher on down the line, none of us can raise a hand in the presence of God and say, I've never sinned. All have sinned. The Old Testament prophets said, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own ways. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. Repent is a biblical word that simply means make a U-turn. Perhaps coming into church today, your attitude in life is I'm the boss. I'm in control. Nobody tells me what to do. It's my life, my decision, my way, my choice, my dream. No preacher is going to tell me what to do. No religion is going to tell me how to live. No Bible is going to tell me what path I'll walk. And the Bible has a verse for that. It says, There is a way that seemeth right unto men, but the end thereof is destruction. One translation says death, physical death, spiritual death, eternal death you're walking your own way it'll walk you right past the rapture and it'll walk you straight into the tribulation and it'll walk you straight to the altar of the antichrist one day where government mandates will require you to pledge your life to the antichrist and without it revelation 13 says no one will be able to buy or sell you will be completely excluded and once you are separated, then the Bible says you'll be beheaded. I said it before, I'll say it again. One day, you will recognize you only had but two real eternal choices in life. To pledge your life to Christ who died on a cross to forgive you of your sins. Or to pledge your life to an antichrist. Who will be the first chapter of hell. In an eternal book of hell that grows worse by every passing sentence. Come to Christ while there's opportunity. For one day, maybe even while I'm preaching, I'll be interrupted by the sound of a trumpet unlike any I have ever heard before that I have preached about for over 40 years. And the Bible said in the twinkling of an eye, Do it while there's an opportunity. This church loves you. This pastor and 
all of the staff in this church truly love the people of Maine. The things this church does for our community, for our schools, making sure no kid goes back to school in fall and winter in Maine without a brand new coat. Hundreds and hundreds of families that can't put food on the table being fed by the people of this church every single week, on and on and on. But this church didn't die for your sins. They'll nurture you. They'll welcome you. They'll love you. But the only way to be right with God is you've got to make a personal decision to recognize sin, repent of sin, receive Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to keep you. I just want to pray what many people call a sinner's prayer with you at this altar. And people ask me all the time, why can't you just say a prayer and let me stand here? Well, Jesus said in Luke's gospel in the 12th chapter, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and the angels. But he said, if you confess me openly before men, I'll confess you publicly before my Father. Does it take faith and courage and humility to come at an altar and pray with a preacher? Of course it does. But it takes faith and courage and humility to live for the Lord. It takes faith and courage and humility to do anything of substance. Much easier to follow the crowd. Drive down on the way home this afternoon with me and we'll stop at the Penobscot River. It's not frozen over. And if you throw a stick from the bank into that river, 100% of the time, it'll float with the current towards the ocean. Much easier to float than to fly. But today you can make a decision that guarantees not only the forgiveness of your sins, but hope for your family and hope for the future and the security of knowing that in this world in which we live as it marches headlong towards the coming one world system, you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I always ask those that have the courage, and for some of you it might be the first time, others of you perhaps wandered away from the Lord, and today you're coming back home. But I always ask those that have the courage, you be the very first ones to come worship team in just a moment is going to sing a song of invitation. As they do, I'm going to kneel and pray here for you that God will give you the courage to do what you ought to do. Christian, I always ask you to do something as well that is very, very important, and that is I want you to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and I want you to take an account of the people that might be sitting by you or around you. Maybe some of you have family or friends or neighbors, or maybe there's somebody here that's never been here before. But during the altar call, you can just turn to them and say, I'll walk with you. If you'd like to go and make that commitment and be sure of salvation, I'll walk with you. You can come with them. And then we're going to pray a prayer together. The pastor will come and then dismiss this service. By coming to this altar, you're saying, in these end times, I want to be a real Christian. In these end times, I want to know my sin is forgiven. In these end times, I want God to know I'm on his side. In these end times, I want to know that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed my past, my present, and God will take me by the hand and walk me through his future. If that's what God is speaking to you about, you need to make that move. Start coming right now, and then we'll pray. I have decided to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus.